Now this morning, I want to transition just for a moment with that thought to this idea of serving. How many of you just love having a leader in your life that is an ogre? I just did a great survey, and, and zero out of however many people are in here love to have an ogre as, as, as someone over them. How many of you love to have someone who's always looking out for you, thinking about you, doing things for you, caring about you? How many of you would love to have a leader over your life? Man, hands are going up everywhere. Now, here, here's the thing. Today, we all have different ideas of what someone who is a leader should look like or be like. We all have this idea of some leaders need to be direct and to the point. Some need to, to know a direction and just go with it. There are different personalities in the room. I know that there are some lions in this room. It's all about getting the task done, running ahead, and if people don't get on board, they can just jump off ship. I know that's how you lions think. And then there's the shepherds in the room that's going, now we don't need to do anything unless everybody's taken care of and we're all okay with the direction we're going in. So I know you're all in, in this room right now thinking through this idea of someone being a leader. But as we look around at leaders in our life and in our communities that are leading our government, that's leading our businesses, that's leading our homes, that's leading our, 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 our schools, let us not remove the biblical mandate of what Jesus has said just because this world wants to teach us something different. So let's really dive into what God has to say because I am absolutely convinced Jesus is not an example to follow. He is a model to emulate. I'm going to say that again. Jesus is not an example to follow. He's a model to emulate. He is someone that we are to be like. We are to uh, follow after everything he does, what he thinks, how he, he acts. All these things we are to do. He's not just an example. And when, when I say that, when I often think of an example, it's like saying this is one way it can be done. So I want to tell you this morning, there isn't two ways that it should be done. There is only one way. That's why Jesus is the model. He's not an example of many. He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the only way that we should, should live. And as we come to faith in Christ, we are empowered by the Holy Spirit to do just that. Today, the basis for greatness in God's kingdom does not rest on status or power, prestige, knowledge. It doesn't rest on authority. The power of God's kingdom in your life rests on being humble, Christ-like, character, integrity, all centered around Jesus being the model in your life. So let's dive in a little bit into Mark chapter 10. We, for those of you who have been here that's been going through this series in Mark, you'll notice that we're skipping several chapters, and there's a reason for that today, because what we want to talk about is found in chapter 10 when Jesus, the, Jesus does something unexpected when it comes to being great, being a leader, being someone people look up to, because he's got these disciples, and he has called them apostles. He's given them a title and a position called apostle. He has sent them out to preach, to cast out demons, to perform miracles. They have done all these things, and they've done it in the name of Christ. And they have this title of apostle that Jesus gave them, and they are also called disciples. Now, there are a lot of disciples. There were more than 12 disciples. Hopefully, all of you knew. If you did not, now you know there were more than 12 disciples. There were hundreds of disciples, but there were only 12 apostles, but they were still disciples. Now, what is a disciple? Well, a disciple is someone who is emulating, modeling Jesus Christ, learning to be like Him in everything they do. And what happened was it turned their thinking completely upside down because he would do things that they weren't expecting. They were expecting Jesus to be nice and to heal people, but then he would teach on things that would just turn their world upside down. He would touch people that nobody else would touch. He would do stuff that would blow their mind. But they were following after a man who was not following after culture. They were following after, after a man who was not following after the popular opinion of the day. They were following after a man. They were a disciple of a man who only saw God the Father and no one else in what he should do. 
He sought after the will of God, he received the will of God, and he would do the will of God. He would speak the will of God. So that's who they were going after, and they are wanting to be like him. But this thing arises among these 12 apostles. They had a discussion over in chapter 9. And this is very interesting. I'm going to jump to chapter 9. You don't have to go there unless you want to just take a left in, in your Bible. It's just one block away. It's chapter 9 to the left. In verse 34, it says, But they kept silent, for on the way they had discussed with one another which of them was the greatest. You know what that sounds to me like? It sounds like a bunch of kids. You know how you get a bunch of uh, kids together and they're going to start having these conversations and... And uh, it's very interesting. Yesterday, we were at Shorter U University for Buddy's uh, official visit. Just throwing that in there as, a, as a, uh, uh, a plug from a dad who's proud of his son. We're sitting there, and I'm watching these football players. And it's very interesting to watch football players together because they size each other up without saying a word. I don't know if you've ever seen this, but you get a bunch of kids in, the in a room together, toddlers together. You get football players together, athletes together, and they're looking at each other going, yeah, I can take him. I'm better than he is. I'm stronger than him. I'm faster than him. I got more to offer than him. That's just the attitude that you get, especially with guys. You get guys in a room, and they're like, oh, yeah, my car's bigger, my truck's bigger, my bank account's bigger, I got bigger muscles, my family's better than yours. That's right. I'm the man. That's just something that happens amongst guys sometimes, right? Come on, guys. Help me out here. Isn't that the way guys act sometimes? I said sometimes. That's the way we act, especially when we're young. But here are these 12 apostles, and they're, they're secretly talking. Why do you think they're secretly discussing this quietly? Why would they do that? Because they know Jesus wouldn't like it. They knew enough to know we better keep this conversation to ourselves. But here they are. They are having this conversation, talking about which one of them is the greatest. You know Peter was speaking up. Peter was, was that lion of the group. He was always the one who would speak before he would think. He would act before he would process what the results may be. He was the one who would just go. You know Peter was saying, it's me, guys. You know it's me. I'm one of the... The chosen group. It's Peter, James, and John. I've got to be the man. I've got to be the greatest of all of you. I would even say Peter had bragging rights of being the strongest because we can see, by the way, there is scriptural evidence that Peter was jacked. I mean, Peter had some muscle. He was one tough guy. So Peter could have been saying, I'm the greatest. It's all about me. Or maybe James and John, who were the sons of Zebedee, were saying, I am the greatest. As a matter of fact, we probably could agree with that because when we get to chapter 10, which is just one chapter away from where we were just looking, we find that there's two of them that decides we ain't keeping this to ourselves anymore because we want to know. We got to know who's the greatest. So in verse 35 of chapter 10, the Bible says, James and John, the two sons of Zebedee, came up to Jesus saying to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. <laughs> you know they're setting him up. We all know. If, if our kids, if you love me, would you do anything for me? And all of our responses are, it depends on what it is. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, what do you want me to do for you? See, sometimes the best answer is a question. They said to him, Grant that we may sit one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or to be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized? They said to him, We are able. Absolutely, Jesus. Bring it on. Okay, I did commentate there just for a moment. And Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you shall drink. And you shall be baptized with the baptism which I am baptized. But to sit on my right or on my left is not mine to give, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. Hearing this, the other ten became, began to feel indignant with James and John. Let's stop there just for a moment. 
Because I want to explain to you what they're asking for. If there is a ruler and he is sitting on the throne, he is the most powerful man in the kingdom. You follow me? To his right is the second most powerful man in all of kingdom. And to his left is the third most powerful person in all of the kingdom. So what James and John is asking, we want to be set above every single person that is and is to come in your kingdom. We want to sit on your right and on your left. We want to be the men. And Jesus says to them, are you willing to go through what I have to go through? And without really knowing, because they're so focused on power, they go, absolutely, we'll go through it. And then Jesus reveals to them, it's not mine to give this to you, but it's already determined who's going to sit there. And the, in, the response of the other ten disciples is very curious. Because it says in verse, verse uh, 40, uh, 41, Hearing this, the other ten began to feel indignant with James and John. I want you to pause for a moment and ask yourself, why were they feeling that way? Now, some of you may be thinking, because they wanted to be in charge. And that's not fair. Why is it not fair? Because the other ten, think about this, were upset because those two might take away from them what they wanted. Have you ever stopped to consider the other ten disciples were struggling with the exact same issue that James and John just vocalized. Because we see in chapter 9 that they're having this discussion secretly as disciples. James and John just brings it to the forefront. They're the ones who just blurt it out. They're the lions in the room. I'm not sure where Peter is at this point, but he's probably sitting back going, go ahead, guys, ask them. I know I'm going to be the guy over there. We don't know if that's the way Peter was, but we know Peter was a lion. But at this point, the other ten get upset because they are wanting the same thing James and John is asking for. They were wanting power. They were wanting position. They were wanting prestige. They wanted recognition. They wanted people to look at them. And then Jesus, in verse 42 calling them to himself. I want you to know today one of the most important things that you can do in your life is to come close to Jesus. Jesus is calling each of us to himself to come near. Even if we do have bad attitudes sometimes, even if we are in bad moods sometimes or we become indignant and upset or we are whatever the issue going on in our life he wants to he is pleading for us to come to him so he calls these disciples to himself and he says to them you know that those who are recognized as rulers of the gentiles domineer dominate over them and their people in high position and exercise authority over them and probably every one of the disciples are going yeah we know that that's exactly why we want it but it cuts to the quick when Jesus uses uses the word but sometimes because there are things that we like that make us comfortable there are things we want to believe and think. There are directions that we want to go in. There are ways that we want to act that make us feel good. And since we feel good, it must be from God. However, Jesus then says, But. I want to make sure everybody understands Jesus did not come to make you feel good. He came to redeem you from the lostness of sin in your life. He came to make you good through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit to bring righteousness out of you. And so Jesus, in His loving way, He does not call them names. He does not demean them. He just simply says, but it is not this way among you. I want to stop and wonder, was Jesus just listening to the conversation? Because that's what they were wanting. 
Jesus says, it is not this way among you. Rather, whoever wants to become prominent among you shall be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you shall be slave of all. I want to stop there just for a moment because there's some things I want us to know about this idea today. And the first is this, is that being a servant is a choice. Being a servant is a choice that God has placed upon us to make. Because I'm going to be real with you. We all struggle with this. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I don't want anybody lying in here and not holding up your hand. We all struggle with the idea of serving. There comes these moments in our day, there are moments in our week where things are happening and we become so self-focused that we miss the opportunity to serve someone. That's, that's true of me. That's true of all of us. It may be at the store. It could be... <laughs> Oh, I'm going to get somebody with this one. It could be driving down the road, and instead of letting that person in, you speed up. I know none of you have ever been guilty of that, right? Because we want to be first. We want to be in front. We want to be in charge. How dare them try to get in front of me? A servant would go, you know what? You go right ahead. It's saving you zero, and I just saved gas by slowing down. A servant attitude is not about us, but we all struggle with this because we live in the flesh. But Jesus is making it clear to them that this is a choice, but it is not this way among you. Rather, whoever wants to become prominent, whoever wants to be something, must become a servant. Diakonese is the word in verse 43. It's very interesting that Jesus uses this word because it comes into play in the church later on. That this is a model. This is actually the theme of the the entire book of Mark. Mark wants us to understand Jesus the servant. He wants us to see Jesus as a servant. And it cuts against the grain of men. It cuts against, against the grain of culture. It cuts against the grain of what sometimes we feel is right. But being a servant is a choice. Whoever aspires to become great among you, let him be your house servant. One who voluntarily renders useful service to others. Voluntarily. The only way you volunteer is to make a choice. To do it. So to be a servant, you have to choose that. Well, pastor, I'm... I just struggle with that. I'm not that way. Well, you have more opportunities than other people because you struggle with it. You have an opportunity to choose. And you need to choose being a servant to others. The second thing that we can see in 43 through 45, let's go back to 43. But it's not this way among you. Rather, whoever wants to become prominent among you shall be your servant. Whoever wants to be first among you shall be slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give His life as a ransom for many. Warren Wiersbe said this, The cross must come before the crown, the suffering before the glory. Serving involves sacrifice. You have to sacrifice something to serve. It may be your time, it may be your resources, it may be your thinking, it may be a lot of your attitude, your feelings in the moment. But Jesus has directed for us to serve and to make a choice to be servants, and we must sacrifice to serve. If it's easy for you to serve, then you're making no sacrifice, and you're doing something that's easy. But God asks us to serve when it's hard. He says to pray for our enemies. Do good to those who despitefully use us. That lady at the store that was really rude to you, Jesus calls us not to be rude back, but to serve her. See, this is is the unexpected Jesus. This is the stuff that turns everything upside down that we don't like. And can I, as the pastor this morning, tell you something? This don't make me feel good either. Don't think that, oh, he's the pastor. This this is just something he don't struggle with. I struggle with it. There are times I don't want to serve people. 
There are times, there's some of you I don't want to serve. <laughs> Actually, I just said that to be funny. I love all of you guys. Y'all are just absolutely perfect. But there are people in your life you come across that you go, mm, instead of getting you a glass of water, can I throw a glass of water on you? Have you ever had that feeling before? Have you ever just gone, man, I would just love to dump a tray right on top of your head right now? <laughs> See, we're being honest. We're being real. It's something we just struggle with. But Jesus has directed for us to serve. He's asked us to make that choice, and it's going to require sacrifice. See, whenever you choose to be a servant, you're giving up certain things that you have access to. When you are a slave to all, you're giving up all access to everything you have access to. And you're relinquishing it into the control of the Master, Jesus Christ. This is not easy. This is extremely hard. But I want to circle back to what I said in the very beginning. We do not do this because Jesus is an example for us. We do this because Jesus is the model for us. We are to do as he has directed, as he modeled for us to do. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6 through 8 says that he humbled himself, taking on the form of a servant. And became obedient even unto death. The death on a cross for you. See, he understood to be a servant will require sacrifice. And for him, he sacrificed his life for you and I. So, being a servant is a choice and serving involves sacrifice. And being a servant is birthed. I love this part. This will get me excited. Being a servant is birthed out of understanding the cost of freedom. There was a young man one day who decided he was going to make things right. His mama would ask him to load the dishwasher. He filled out a bill. Loading the dishwasher, five bucks. Oh, you want me to take out the trash, mama? Good, take out the trash, five dollars. Clean my room? Sure, clean my room. Five dollars. Oh, you want me to watch my little brother? Yep. Five dollars. And that night, he left his bill in the kitchen on the bar for his mother to see. That she owed him twenty dollars for the work of his day. The next morning he wakes up and he finds next to his bill lying another little note. At the very top it said, carrying you nine months in the womb, no charge. Carrying you back and forth to the doctor when you were sick and staying up all night multiple times to make sure you were okay, no charge taking you back and forth to all the sporting events that you like to go to, no charge. Sacrificing my very life to give you the best you possibly can have, no charge. I'm pretty sure all of you would guess what the young man probably did the next day. He abandoned his philosophy that I'm only going to work if I get something out of it. Because he began to realize the one to whom he was serving for is the one who has paid the price for him. See, the problem comes in because we think serving is about the people around us. When serving others is about the one who died for us. Our focus becomes so much on us and them that we refuse to do what Christ has asked and we forget that it's the one who left heaven and came to earth and lived a life and died on the cross with you in mind so that you could have a right relationship with God. He was beaten for our transgressions. It is for freedom's sake that we serve other people. When we understand the freedom we have received from Christ when it comes to serving someone else, it becomes a little simpler. 
So when you look at that person and they really just tick you off, you think, man, they ugly. They just bad ugly. They bugly. They're being mean. They're being rude. I'm not serving them. You need to stop and think. Jesus died for them just like he died for you. The price he paid on the cross is the same price he paid for you that he paid for them. And that was the death, the shedding of blood. So when we get this fleshly attitude that it's all about someone else and how they act and whether they deserve to be served, let us stop and be reminded that if that was the attitude that Jesus had had for you and I, none of us would receive mercy and grace. None of us in this room would even be here today. But because of the freedom that he purchased for us, we serve other people. And so this serving is birthed out of the freedom that he has brought to us. We understand the price of the freedom that we have because of the price he paid. Ken Blanchard said, if you choose to follow Jesus, you are no longer your own. You don't belong to yourself. He is the one that you live for. He is the one that you model. He is the one that you follow. We are all to model Jesus. Verse 44 said, Jesus said, you must be slave to all. He's looking at James and John and Peter and those in the group who wants to have this control, this prestige, this power, and he's saying, you have to become a slave to all your brothers. Submitting to them and serve them. Now, I find it fascinating and remarkable that as you fast forward to after the resurrection and the church begins, there arises an issue in Acts chapter 6 where there were some Hellenistic widows who were not getting any food. And so this issue is brought to then the apostles and, and they go, these Hellenistic Jews are not receiving the food. These, these widows are not getting their food. And you know what I read that they were expecting the apostles to do? To go feed them. They were saying, apostles, you need to go feed them. They're not getting their food. You take care of it. But the apostles said, all right, I want you to choose from among yourselves seven men, good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit. Let them go and diakonies, these widows, serve the food and feed them. And then they devoted themselves to what God had called them to, which was the preaching, the studying of the scriptures. And so out of that became this idea of a deacon. Because you want to know what the biblical word is for deacon? You may want to take a wild guess. I mean, if you've been in the room for the last 30 minutes... What do you think the word for deacon is? Servant. Servant. You're absolutely right. Diakonese is the word for deacon. And when I think of that, I mean, God could have come up with a lot of other offices or positions or, or, or things in the church, but he, he chose to help direct these people to have servants in a role in the church. And I believe it was God saying, I want to emphasize this idea of serving. And there are some people who, will, who are called to a higher level and a beautiful thing of serving. They are the ones who are to step into that role and that position. Now, it doesn't mean that none of us should, should serve because... To me, when I look at Mark chapter 10 and I look at, at all of the New Testament, the idea of serving one another is the duty of every born-again believer, every disciple of Jesus Christ. We are to serve one another. But then there comes those people who are serving that God draws out with a higher level of responsibility in their life. This role of deacon does not come with a higher level of authority. You know what it comes with? A higher level of submission to those to whom they serve. Jesus did not call the apostles out to a higher level of authority that day. He called them out to a higher level of submission, 
of being a servant. And thus, in the New Testament, we find the office of a deacon brought about. Diocones, to serve one another, to be a deacon in the church, there is no place for self-service. It's about serving others. Service is always directed toward other people, and it's never to be directed at just oneself. Deacons are Christians who serve the Lord, and they lead the way as an example to serve. And that is why the Word of God says they should be tested, we find in Timothy. And that testing is looking to see, are they already serving? What are they doing? How well do they serve? And there's a whole list of qualifications that Buddy read earlier about this role as deacon. It's something to aspire to for some. And when that happens... God directs us to applaud that moment in that person's life. Not everyone is called to be a deacon. Not everyone steps up to that place. But can I tell you something? To be a deacon isn't a step up in prestige. It is a, it is a kneel down in servanthood to all. Do not ever think that being a deacon is something that raises your authority and your ability to be a deacon is to kneel down. As Jesus looked at Peter that day, at the Lord's Supper, the last, the last Supper, and he did something that most of you wouldn't let me do, and that is wash your feet. We've already been through that one week. Most of you wouldn't really want me to wash your feet. And I understand. But Jesus comes to Peter, the lion in the group, the leader that's always listed first, and begins to wash his feet. And Peter goes, don't you wash my feet, Jesus. No way will you wash my feet. But Jesus says, if I don't wash your feet, you'll have no part with me. So let me share this with you about that. And I would love to do a sermon on, on that one day, because this changed my life. Because there are some of you in this room that when I say servant, you're like, I'm on board with that. I mean, I love to serve people. I love to do things for other people. I just, I look around and I find things that people need and I do it for them. So for you, I bet I know what your struggle is. It's hard for you to let other people do something for you. You struggle to let someone else serve you because you see yourself as so much of a servant that if someone tried to do something for you, you would ignore it, walk away, push it away. You'd go, no, 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 no. no. But I'm absolutely convinced Jesus was telling Peter that day, when you serve, you also should accept being served. And that's hard for a servant. That's a big struggle. Sometimes. But the flesh is a struggle. There's so many things that are a struggle when you're a servant. We're all called to be a servant, but there's also a call for someone by the authority of God to be a deacon, to be a model of being a servant to all. So this morning we have the privilege of actually ordaining someone who has never served in the role or the um, position as a deacon who is going to come and be ordained as a deacon today. Michael, would you please join me on the stage? And Buddy Anderson, would you please come? Buddy has his Bible and he's got it open. I love Buddy Anderson. <laughs> I have, uh, I have watched as our deacons become more and more of a servant here at this, this place. Each one of our deacons are people who already serve in some capacity. Now, I've known Michael for a long Michael, how long have I known you? Should we talk about this? How old is Anna? Oh, Lord. Ten years. Ten years. I've known you for ten years. You were with me at Mount Salem in Flyer Branch, and then when I came here, the Lord led you all to come up here and for. Roughly about the last seven years, I have personally watched you grow in your faith. I have watched you serve the people of this church for seven years. 
zero recognition. Your name is never called. You're the one who, except for maybe on Brotherhood Breakfast, we might say, see Michael Cheeseman if you need to know anything. You cook. You do Bible study. You've always had the attitude, whatever is needed, I'll do it. You have shown yourself to be a man that is absolutely described in Scripture. And I am absolutely honored to stand on this stage this day and say I'm looking forward to serving alongside you as you serve as a deacon and I serve as your pastor. And your family, wow, you married so well, Michael Cheeseman. You married over your head. You know that, right? Good. That is definitely a test to make sure you fully understand. <laughs> we call that marrying up. Yeah. Yes, yes, marrying up, yeah. knowing that you are a, 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 a man of good integrity to tell the truth. So you truly have the character, the ability. You, you, you've got the faith, the strength. You have managed your home well, seeing Anna sing at Christmas Eve up here. Seeing her love to serve other people, your wife serving, y'all serving in nursery. Y'all are always engaged somewhere to serve the people of this church and in this community. So I want to say thank you, Michael, for setting forth that example that you've done so well as to what it is to be a deacon. Thank you. Buddy wants to say something. I, I do. I can tell. I got I to gotta jump in <laughs> Go and ahead. say, you know, we, we had this marvelous group of young people leading our worship this morning, I think, and I'm not sure, I don't have a statistic on it, but mentally, Anna is the youngest person to ever sing a solo on this stage, right? Uh, I think she was, what, was she four or five when uh, she sang? I think she was younger. Oh, yeah. She was four, four. when she was sang she for four? the first time up I th here? I thought, she was, well, Anna, I thought she was like three. She may be four three. is pretty young. That's, that's, that's pretty young. She sang a solo with our choir, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. Our, our Christmas, Christmas cantata. cantata, yeah. Four years old. That's marvelous. Yep. So, Buddy, tell everyone how this process of becoming a deacon happens here at Chicopee. Yes. Well, when we have a, when we have a vacancy uh, in the deacon ministry, we ask the church to nominate who uh, they think would make a deacon for our church um, wait a minute I got notes <laughs> it's hard to remember all this stuff wouldn't be hard if you were 12 or 14 right but as your hair begins to change you do have to write down stuff you do yes so the need arises one and then second we take nominations the nominations are prayed over The deacon ministry team, which is the deacons, consider all those who have been nominated. The pastor leads us in that. More prayer. More prayer by all of us. Then the, the person who has risen to the top of the list is approached and it's discussed with them. That person would then meet with the deacon ministry. Afterwards, the deacons would vote. That's what happens. It's not a. It's not a. Um, oh, I. I think Chad make a good deacon. Let's get him. He he can start next week. It's because he's so good looking. Ask Amanda. <laughs> <laughs> it's very serious. It is. It's, it, is a, it is a process. It's very serious. Because it is serious. Mm. It is serious. But the one thing that I love that our deacon ministry team did a few years ago at a deacon retreat is y'all made sure that you were a ministry team and not a board. Exactly. Why is that? S still in our Constitution and bylaws, it says mm -hmm. board of deacons, yeah. but we are not called that anymore. Because we are called as ministers. We are ministers of the gospel. That is what we do. We're ministers. We are servers. Um, Speaking of serving, if you'll hold your arm like this. 
as you see this towel draped on his arm, let it remind you of a waiter. Waiters do one thing. They serve the ones that they are waiting on. And with this towel, it is a symbolization of what this role encompasses totally and completely the heart of serving. Yes, and uh, the uh, scripture that Pastor Clyde was uh, talking about just a moment ago, I did not know he was going to talk about it. But this towel, you see what it says on there. Lead like Jesus. John chapter 13, starting in verse 1 through verse 9, says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world. He loved them to the end. During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come forth from God and was going back to God, got up from supper, that's Jesus, and laid aside his garments, And taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into the basin, began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So when we put that towel on Michael's arm, he's following the model of our Lord Jesus. And Michael, today, there's one other thing that's very important for you as you are the spiritual leader of your home. You have shown that. You have exemplified that. You have modeled that as Christ has asked us to. There is a cup right here, and it says to be still. This cup is to remind you to be still before the Lord and know that he is God. To come to him as he asked his disciples, come to me. When he called the 12 apostles and he went up on the mountain and he prayed all night long and he fasted, who am I going to call? He then called them to himself. Jesus has called you to him and he requires of you to be still and know that he is God. To spend those moments with him in prayer and in meditation and let him speak to you. And today, Michael... You shall, by the power of the Holy Spirit living within you, by God's grace, serve God in this congregation to the best of your ability by putting God's word and his will first and foremost above your own. And as Christ modeled for us all, by putting others before yourself. Heather, would you please join him up here on the stage? This is his lovely wife that I believe God gives us his word, his Holy Spirit, and our wives to help us become better men of God. When you find the person God has for you, He's designed for you, you will become closer to being like Christ. And that is God's desire for us. So Heather, you are part of this ministry as well now. And this is the difficult part. Because as you step into this ministry to serve, the enemy does not like it. You will find spiritual attacks coming your way. You may find discouragement. You may find days that you go, what in the world did I do signing up for this? But remind yourself you did not sign up for it. This is something that God has implanted on your heart that you just live out. And he will empower you and strengthen you and help you as a family as you move forward together to be an example of us all of what it means to serve one another with the idea of the freedom that Christ has given us as the focus of why we serve. So Michael, Heather, what an honor it is to see you become a deacon. Now to the church, for all of those who are here, this is the charge to you that you shall encourage, pray, cooperate with the deacon ministry in the fulfillment of the mission of God. I did not say for this church. I said the mission of God of God because the mission of God transcends and goes beyond these walls 
and reaches into every place where God is lifted up and Christ is first. So we as believers of Christ are part of the big church of God. We are to support those who serve as deacon. And if you would join me by standing today, we are going to pray for this family. I want to thank all those who have served currently as deacons and served as deacons in in the past. Thank you for what you have done and what you continue to do to reach people and to exemplify for us what it is to be like Jesus. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 13 says that this is a noble and an honoring place to be serving as a deacon. So Michael, Heather, welcome to be part of this ministry team that's very special that comes with challenges. Your seven-day challenge, I want to tell you that I was going to skip it, wasn't going to even put it up, but I think I would be failing if I did not give you your seven-day challenge. So your seven-day challenge is this. Today we ordained the deacon, but you heard a message about how Christ has called us all to serve. Christ has called us to serve and go beyond ourselves. And to do that, we must sacrifice something. So here's your seven-day challenge. Sacrifice something and serve someone. Sacrifice something and serve someone. Do that at some point over the next seven days. So what we'd like to do now is pray for Michael and Heather and their family. Where's Anna? Come here, Anna. You've got to be up here. Come here, Grayson. Oh, I didn't see him back there. Oh, look at these cute kids. Okay, let's all do it together. One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> Man, I like the way he dresses with a vest. Right? You were, you, yeah, you were. You know, I'm, yeah, I like that. No, I, I like the way you. <laughs> all right, if, if you would like to, if you want to, just reach your hand out toward the stage so that you can pray and we're going to use that as laying hands on, laying on of hands of this family. Buddy Anderson, would you please lead us in prayer? For Father us? God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for this family, God, for their witness to each of us, to our community. God, we thank you that you have given not only Michael, but their whole family, the heart of servants. God, you have, you have given them hearts that love you. They love you first, God. They love you first and foremost, and that shows in the way they live their life. Father God, we we lift you up today. We lift up this family, God, in, in praise and thanksgiving. Father, we ask you to give them strength, courage, wisdom, and understanding moving forward in this role. Father, thank you for blessing us with their lives. And allowing them to walk along life's path with us. In Jesus' name, we pray pray this prayer. Amen. Amen. I know you may want to come by and say hey to them and say something encouraged to them. They're going to be standing right here. Uh, Buddy Anderson, would you please present the certificate to Michael and his family? And they will come, if if y'all want to come right down there, he is going to give you that. And if you need to speak with me, I will be in the back. I would love to pray with you. I'd love to help you in anything that has to do with today's sermon or anything about being a